Okay, so the final scene of the play takes place only a half an hour later from the previous one. So there's this very sudden um, sort of unraveling of um, the plot in the conclusion. It takes place in the, you can see the kitchen in Cabot's bedroom. It's after dawn, and the sky is brilliant with sunrise. So there's this, I think, suggestion of, of possible resolution in this in this aspect of the temporal setting that we have this new day, and that it, the sky being brilliant with this. The sky always, you know, being invoked throughout this play as this symbol of uh, reconciliation. Abby sits at the table, her body limp and exhausted, her head bowed down over her arms, her face hidden. So again, that sort of dejection and despair has drained that that essential vitality that's such an integral part of her character throughout the play. Um, <coughs> further down, Cabot is still asleep. He looks towards the window and gives a snort of surprise and irritation, throws back the, the covers and begins hurriedly pulling on his clothes. Without looking behind him, he begins talking to Abby, whom he supposes beside him. So there's this hostility to beauty in his in his actions here where he looks out the window and kind of snorts with a surprise and irritation and he's bothered because he at this moment in time he can't look at this scene of, of brilliant natural beauty because he's worried about getting out on the field so his, his his vision is compromised again by his um apollonian commitment to rigidity and work thunder and lightning abbey i ain't slept this late in 50 years looks as if the sun was full rise almost Further down, he says, he, he, he completely doesn't realise that she's there when he speaks these lines. And so that, again, that dramatic irony highlights his sort of lack of vision, his lack of understanding and awareness. He tiptoes to the cradle and then peers down proudly. And so again, there's this huge sense of dramatic irony of his fatherly pride as he speaks to his, this dead son that's not even his, it's actually his grandson. Morning sunny, pretty as a picture, sleeping sound. He don't bellow all night like most of them. So that sense of his, again, the sort of distinction and the, and the supremacy of his family and his genes as being an extension of him is all undermined here through this dramatic irony that O'Neill so painfully constructs. He goes quietly out the door in the room. A few moments later, enters the kitchen, sees Abby with satisfaction. Again, contributes to this spectacular kind of dramatic irony that kicks off this final scene in the play. And he says, have you got any victuals cooked? And Abby, without moving, says no. He moves towards her sympathetically, you feeling sick? No, pats her on her shoulder and she shudders. So that sense of distance is again deeply um, evident in, in the, the combination of, of dialogue and stage directions and their interactions. He tries to be kind of friendly here. You'd best lie down a spell half jocularly. You'll soon be need your son will be needing you soon. And she shudders. Because he says he ought to wake up with a gnashing appetite in the sound way he's sleeping. And she shudders and then in a dead voice. And it's almost as if death itself has kind of infected her. But not as a result of the baby. But, but I think of her kind of discomfort with, with a frame and her sense of torture over Aben. Cabot then jokes takes after this me this morning I ain't slept so late and, and then she finishes the lines off and she says he's dead and he stares at her in bewilderment so this again I think she's she's completely conscious of her own horror here in these lines and and the the distance between them is is so evident because of her stiff kind of numb almost anesthetized body language and lines and his unusual idiosyncratic sense of humor as he jokes in the bottom of these lines here that she takes after me this morning this is a particularly striking example of, sort of idiosyncratic characterization that O'Neill is using I think to, to try and finish this play with that kind of spectacular dramatic irony to build up its, its sense of tragedy as the plot unravels <clears throat> further over he, she confesses to having killed him he steps back from her aghast. Are you drunk or crazy? Abby suddenly lifts her head and turns on him wildly. I killed him, I tell you. I smothered him. So there's this sense of vengeance that she, that she, I think, is embodying that maternal vengeance that's, that, that is constantly sort of suggested as being inflicted on a friend throughout the play. 
and that she here is the vehicle for them. He stares at her, then bolts out the rear door and can be heard bounding up the stairs. So he goes and checks, puts his hand down on the body in the crib, and an expression of fear and horror comes over his face. And he shrinks away tremblingly. And so here, we see this kind of, I think, a sense of, of, of capacity for understanding and realisation and feeling and passion. But it's, it's a dramatic irony. It's only because of his own sort of mistaken belief that he, that he exemplifies these qualities that he's so lacking throughout the play. This is God Almighty, God Almighty, and he, he stumbles out the door. I ask you why you've done it, you better tell me. And then she communicates with him. She gives him a furious push which sends him staggering back and springs to her feet with wild rage and hatred. And so she suddenly sort of blossoms in this sort of explosion of rage and, and possesses comparable power with him, really for the first time physically in the play. She says, don't you dare touch me. What right have you to question me about him? And at the bottom, she reveals the truth. I hate you. I love Avon. I did from the first. And he was Avon's son. Mine and Avon's not yours. So he exposed, she here exposes his defeat in the forces of Dionysian and Apollonian compulsion that here he is isolated from these forces of fate and he is on the wrong side of these, these powerful forces of compulsion. He stands looking at her dazedly, a pause, finding his words with an effort dully. <coughs> that was it, what I felt, poking around the corners while you lied, holding yourself from me, saying you'd already conceived. And so here, the compulsion that he doesn't recognise throughout the play is what he finally reveals. And this is his real moment of anagoriasis, his, his final understanding and recognition. And that's where I think his sort of dazed body language comes from, is that, that first moment of full comprehension of his fatal flaw and the things that have, have drawn, well, of his fate, certainly. He blinks back one tear. And so again, there's this minuscule capacity for feeling in his stage direction. And that is really his hamasha, his, his inability to connect with people emotionally, his inability to be a kind of dynamic, vital, emotional human being rather than this rigid, starchy, self-abnegating um, puritan. Abby hysterically says, don't you, don't you? And Cabot, with a concentrated effort, stiffens his body into a rigid line, hardens his face into a stony mask. And so this, this imagery that, that O'Neill uses in his stage direction sees this sort of forceful conjuring of rigidity and control as he, he collapses back into his, his fault. And so whether we can call this anagnorisis, I think, is, is complicated by this failure to recognise his limitations. And he says... I've got to be like a stone, a rock of judgment. And so I think whether we can call it that it is only partial. We can only partially call this an agnosis because he doesn't really at this moment in time take full heed and, and full consciousness of his hamasha, of his fatal flaw. He says, I suspicioned it all along. I've was, I felt there was something unnatural somewhere. So the house got so lonesome and cold, driving me down to the barn. So it's a limited kind of an agnosis where he seems to understand the forces driving against him, but doesn't get his own role in them, doesn't get his own flaws and take, you know, conscious awareness of this. And actually this develops. He says, you didn't fool me, not altogether, leastways. I'm too old a bird growing ripe on the bough. And again, that lack of awareness is important here because they did fool him and it's his central fault. He didn't know that this was going on fully. He was partially aware of it, but didn't have a full consciousness of it. And that is his, his fault, is that his inability to see his faults. He then becomes aware he's wandering, straightens again, and looks at Abby with a cruel grin. So again, he's trapped in that kind of simple vengefulness, that desire to be hostile to others. So you'd like to have murdered me instead of him, would you? Well, I'll live to a hundred. I'll live to see you hung. I'll deliver you up to the judgment of God and the law. And so here he is collapsing back into that Apollonian psychology and that Apollonian state of being. Further down, Aben, she, she reveals that Aben has gone to the sheriff and he considers this a pause and then in a hard voice, well, I'm thankful for him saving me the trouble. So he's conscious of his rivalry here. 
conscious of his rivalry with, with his own son. I'll get to work. He goes to the door, then turns in a voice full of strange of emotion. He'd ought to have been my son, Abby. You'd ought to have loved me. I'm a man. If you'd loved me, I'd never told no sheriff on you, no matter what he did, even if there was, if it was vile to me. So here, there's no real sense of abstract justice in his behaviour. You know, he 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 simply is asserting himself as an individual at, through his sort of maturity, and and doesn't really have any admiration for Aben's sort of abstract commitment to justice here and his willingness to suffer on the part of someone else. And that's ultimately what makes Aben of some form a, a kind of a sort of hero figure. I think is that he, it's his willingness to take responsibility for the flaws that led to this tragic fate of his own son and suffer for them as well as his as his partner abby and then she says there's more to it than you know and it makes him tell and then he says dryly for your sake i hope they be he goes out comes around the gate and stares up at the sky so again there's that searching for escape from this conflict and the search for resolution it says for a moment he is old and weary he murmurs despairingly god almighty i'll be lonesome and and here it is, is this collapse back into that Apollonian rigidity and the isolation that it brings with it. And this is that life and that state of being that O'Neill was so keen to criticise. He hears running footsteps to the left, he lurches to the gate. Cabot grabs Aben by the shoulder and says, did you tell the sheriff? And he nods and says, aye. He pushes him away and sends him sprawling, laughing with withering contempt. Good for you, a prime chip off your Mari bean. He goes to the barn, laughing harshly, and Aben scrambles to his feet. Suddenly, Cabot turns grimly threatening. Get off this farm when the sheriff takes it. So again, this possessiveness is his kind of final state, I think, here. And that final act of bravado that he, he communicates to Aben is that act of possession. Aben doesn't appear to have heard him, runs to the door and comes into the kitchen. Abby looks up with a cry of anguished joy. And so that paradoxical uh, state of being shows us that sort of passion that she has for him and the horror of her experience. But she's sort of pained in the horror of, her, of understanding the gravity of what she's done, but joyful at his return. He stumbles over and throws himself on his knees beside her, sobbing brokenly. And so his his body language here is an admission of part guilt, I think, of, of, of self-subordination and of self-awareness. And she says, forgive me. And he says, sorry, he says, forgive me. And, and then says, I love you, forgive me. And then her stage, her stage direction is ecstatic. And in a play that makes such a strong kind of case for this sort of Dionysian transcendentalism, that word is not used lightly and that ecstatic connection between the two of them finished off with a fierce passion of possession as she kisses his head, I think shows us that deep sort of almost self-transcendence that they that, that Aben has displayed by willing by willingly committing to suffering alongside of her. They become something more than themselves as individuals. And so there is this sort of sense of resolution and self-transcendence in this ecstatic, passionate connection that takes place right before the end of the play. <clears throat> Aben says, I woke up, I told him, he says, wait till I get dressed. I was waiting, I got thinking of you, I got thinking to how I loved you. It hurt like something was busting in my chest and head. I got to cry and I know sudden I loved you, yeah, and I always would love you. So this love and violence is a sort of testament to the intensity of his passion that something was hurting and it burst in my chest. And she then caresses his hair tenderly. This very strange line where she says, my boy, ain't you? And there's this very creepy kind of maternal Oedipal element to this passionate connection where she adopts this maternal um, performance at the moment, or performance is probably the wrong word because it is authentic, this sort of maternal um, enactment of passion at that moment of their deepest sort of transcendental passionate connection abby shakes says i've got to take my punishment to pay for my sin and so this i think this i think it involves and evokes their their love the the sinful passion that she talks about needing to absorb but aben here and this is the thing that distinguishes him so clearly from a friend he takes responsibility for his flaws i put it in your head i wished he was dead I as much urged you to it. 
And then Abby says, no, it was me alone. And he says, I'm as guilty as you be. He was the child of our sin. And this is a moment of anagnorisis. Of, you know, if we can think of him as a tragic hero, he understands his role in this, in this he understands his hamasha effectively, um, and his role in this tragic plot resolution. She lifts her head as if defying God, and I think she this rejection of religion is really important here because it's in preference for the sanctity of their passionate connection that she rejects it. I don't repent that sin. I ain't asking God to forgive that. And so they, they now are making sense of their passionate connection outside of the realm of, of religious and theological thought. You know, she knows that it's sinful in terms of Christianity, but their commitment to each other is something beyond that. And Aiden says, nor me, but it led up to the other and the murder you did. You did count on me, and it's my murder too. I'll tell the sheriff, and if you deny it, I'll say we planned it together, and they'll believe me, for they suspicion everything we've done, and it will seem likely and true to them. And it is true way down. I did help you somehow. And this is that moment of deep vision that he has. He, this is his greatest moment of perception, that he shares the suffering. And it's probably one of the only noble acts in the play, but it comes on the back of a tragic murder of a child. He lays her head on his sobbing. No, I don't want you to suffer. And so this vengeance brings suffering on them all, really. You know, in the play, they all suffer, and that maternal vengeance of Ma ends up dragging all of them together into it. But it is in a moment of passionate connection between these two lovers. And that's ultimately what has been reconciled they're suffering as she did but they're suffering together with son and and, and lover and, and mother so Avon says i got to pay for my part of the sin and i'd suffer worse leaving you going west thinking of your day and night being out when you was in lowering his voice or being alive when you was dead i want to share with you abby prison or death or hell or anything he looks into her eyes and forces a trembling smile if I'm sharing with you, I won't feel lonesome leastways. And there's that striking difference between him and his father. It's, it's sharing. It's the complete opposite of Ephraim's fate of isolation, but it's sharing guilt and suffering. If there is nothing else left for us to share, we will have to share our guilt and suffering. And that is precisely what he does. But it is a moment of self-transcendence. Aben kisses her tenderly. You can't help yourself. I got you beat for once. And so he here recognises her power over him throughout the play, but his power over her at this moment is on the basis of that same impulse of deep, passionate connection. Abby then forces a smile adoringly. I ain't beat as long as I've got you. So there's no competition between them because they are now united together deeply. Abby says, no, it's him. Don't give him no chance to fight you. So there's this sense of acknowledgement here that, there's, that it's pointless, that their connection is now what matters. And their rivalry is not that important. And it is Cabot. He comes up from the barn in a great state of excitement. So there's this sign of transformation in him. And there's this moment where we just think he's going to understand in the way that Aben has here. And he seems to in these lines below. He stares at them, his face hard, a long pause, but he's still vindictive. You make a slick pair of murdering turtle doves and that sort of... that paradoxical image of murder and turtle doves of, of violent offenders at the same time as being symbols of innocence i think shows us at least some sort of development in his understanding of what's going on you ought to both be hung on the same limb and left there to swing in the breeze and rot a warning to old fools like me to bear their lonesomeness alone and for young fools like you to hobble their lust and this is where there is no progression in his understanding, and you can see that from his state of mind, his, his ontology, his, the state of his being hasn't changed, even though further below he thinks it has, and he's gone about doing something to change it. He can't, he, he says, you know, I should have put up with my Apollonian lonesomeness, and you should have hobbled your lust, and that's precisely the opposite of the message I think this play communicates to, to, to us. The excitement returns to his face, his eyes snap, and he looks crazy. And so this, this madness, madness is always associated with Dionysian connection. I couldn't work today, I couldn't take no interest. And here it is, this is what he should, this is his moment for understanding. 
to hell with the farm, I'm leaving it. I've turned the cows and other stock loose. I've drove them into the woods where they can be free. By freeing them, I'm freeing myself. And so this Dionysian liberation that he seems to be carrying out here from taking, you know, unleashing himself and the farm and the, the self-imprisonment that it represents is this potential moment of liberation in this final act. And he says, I'm quitting here today. I'll set fire to the house and burn and watch and burn and I'll leave you, man, to haunt the ashes and I will the fields back to God so that nothing human can ever touch him. I'll be going to California to join Simeon and Peter, true sons of mine, if they be dumb fools. And the Cabots will find Solomon's minds together. And so this moment of, of potential liberation, of transcendence, is destroyed through this materialistic resolution that completely taints the potential release of this of this very final moment of potential understanding and, and release from him, from himself. He's pulled up the board, and here's where he goes for his money, this sort of circularity in the plot. His release still relies upon money. He stares, feels, stares again, a pause of dead silence. He slowly turns slumping into a sitting position on the floor, his eyes like those of a dead fish, his face in a sickly green of an attack of nausea. He swallows painfully several times, forces a weak smile, so you did steal it. And so this liberation completely and ironically relies upon money. And that, again, is another sign from Unreal that it's, that it's flawed. And then Cabot is back, collapsing into his, into his previous revolution. With one sardonic ha, he begins to recover, and that recovery is the recovery of his Apollonian rigidity. He gets slowly to his feet, strangely. I calculate God give it to him, not you. God's hard, not easy. Maybe there's easy gold in the West, but it ain't God's gold. It ain't for me. I can hear his voice warning me again to be hard and stay on my farm. I can see his hand using Avon to steal to me from weakness. I can feel I be in the palm of his hand, his fingers guiding me. I pause and then he mutters sadly, it's going to be lonesomer now than ever it was before. And I'm getting old, Lord, ripe on the bow. Then stiffening, well, what do you want? God's lonesome, ain't he? God's hard and lonesome. And then this is his final resolution. He resolves in the end to adhere to this sort of Apollonian rigidity and returns to the rigidity of himself and his isolation and his egotism and his, material, and his, and his willful difficulties. And then the sheriff arrives. They've come for you. Just a minute, Jim, I got him safe here. And then Aben suddenly calls. I lied this morning, Jim. I helped to do it. You can take me away. And Abby's broken by this and says no. Take them both. He comes forward, stares at Aben with a trace of grudging admiration. Pretty good for you. Well, I got to round up the stock. Goodbye. And so there's that moment of noble commitment that he just about is willing to acknowledge as something powerful. Abby then says goodbye to him. He turns and strides past the men, comes out around the corner of the house, his shoulder squared, his face stony, and stalks grimly towards the barn. And there he is in full return to his previous state. And so that's, that potential dynamism of his character is frozen in that static Apollonian state. The sheriff embarrassedly says, well, we'd best start. And Abby says, wait. Turns to Aben, I love you, Aben. And he returns it, I love you, Abby. They kiss the three men grin and shuffle embarrassedly, and Abby, Aben takes Abby's hand. They go out the door in the rear, the men following and come from the house, walking hand in hand to the gate. Aben stops there and points to the sunrise. Sky, sun's arising, apparently ain't it? And then she says, I ain't. They both stand for a moment, looking up raptly in attitude, strangely aloof and devout. And there is that moment of full sense of togetherness, of, of natural vitality, of, of reconciliation between their passionate isolation and that natural passionate Dionysian dynamism that's been compelling them together all the way through the play. And then there is this enormous moment of dramatic, of, of well, of situational irony here. So the sheriff ends the play with that repeat of materialism, I think, that suggests that life is doomed to go on in this tragic way that, that Ephraim has, has committed to it. He looks around at the farm enviously to his companion. It's a Jim Dandy farm, no denial, wished I owned it. So that curtain line that seems to show us, in spite of that moment of spectacular sort of rapt connection between the two lovers, that this 
vision of materialistic greed is 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 destined to keep repeating itself connects it very directly with streetcar and that that sense of brutal sort of material realism going on and on you know the game is seven card stud in that final um curtain line in streetcar that shows us i think that the the resumption of a cold sort of materialistic vision of reality that's reasserting itself after the sort of passionate dynamism of the tragedies that unfold in those plays.